Okay. Just Mike making it out. Um, what am I? What a boss, damn it. It is Wednesday, Wednesday streaming, streaming time. time. Hi there, Ed. Are you good? Let's just go and check my screens here because they probably all changed because I've been rearranging things. Uh, editor, yeah, I can turn that off. Uh, just temporarily. Oh, you hear it? Ooh. Ah, I know why. Hold on. I think that's, that's my bad, bad Ed. He's Ed saying, uh, hearing everything twice. Um, I was just looking at the stream view and it's probably feeding back in. Is it better now, Ed? No. Hold on. Wait a minute. I've got two, two mics on here, hold on. Right. Maybe I accidentally turned the other mic on. How's it now? Yeah, I think that that might have been... Oh, I don't know, what is that? Is that the laptop mic? Or my webcam mic, maybe? I don't know. Must have accidentally nudged it on. Thanks for that. Are the levels okay? I'm hoping they are. I don't seem to be redlining too much. I'm in the green and yellow. Cool. Uh, those of you who are not subscribed, please do if you can. 
Uh, the reason it's helpful for me, probably helpful for Twitch as well, is once you get so many, um, you get to keep your streams. When you reach certain levels of uh, participants, you get to keep your streams. I mean, I do record them anyhow, but that would mean separately uploading them, etc., etc. So, if you can register, not only that, but you can also participate in the chat if you like. Always good. So, it's been an interesting week. Um, I have made some progress on some of these things. Right, uh, what do we need to cover? Community-wise on uh, MyStorm. I don't think there was anything new news-wise on MyStorm that I'm aware of. Um, I still haven't seen the update from Scott on the Python stuff either for Circuit Python. I'm still looking for the SPI support on that. Hold on, let me see. Can I let me just have a look at the merge? I may be wrong. Bear with me a sec, first I just check the status of this repository. Just do a quick pull from um, Circuit Python. Pulling. Uh, what have we got on here? Oh, there's a fork. This is to do with issues, not to do with. SPI, I don't think. Hold on. No, I can't see anything on that. That's a shame. So, um, what I'm probably going to do on that front is, I, I don't know if I'm going to have time to do any live, but towards the end, if we've got some time left, then um, perhaps uh, what I can do is just knock up a quick bit banged version of spy um, I'm not unfamiliar to doing that in fact because I had to do it in the last black ice because of the way that the uh, SPI libraries were structured and dynamically turning them on and off was a pain so it's easier just to bit bang when you're actually programming the ice 40 um, in that particular scenario so I've got some examples of that here they're all in C, of course, written for the STM32, but it should be relatively easy to take some of that and just um, knock up a quick Python version in Circuit Python. Um, the other cool news is I do have a camera, um, which is going to be useful for looking at the boards and then when I'm working on different things. So let me give you a quick preview. I can actually show you the setup I've got for uh, my workbench right now. I may have to fiddle with it. I'm still getting used to the focus on it.
Sorry guys. I didn't realize when I switched over to that view it actually turned off the mic. So everything I said is probably um, totally useless. So let me say it again. <laughs> um, I need to do that anyhow. Let me just switch and then add the uh, mix in. Bear with me a sec. So workbench. Need to add in uh, audio. Audio input capture existing from the mixer. Okay. Okay. Right. Let me just try this. I'm going to switch over. Let me know if I uh, lose the audio again, Ed. Hold on. Okay, we got audio now, Ed. <sighs> I kind of assume it kept the audio settings, but it's obviously changed them. Right, okay, so we've now got audio added to that. I had to do it as bring the device back in. That was a painful thing. So what I was saying here is, so I've now got this overhead camera. It's quite a way up. It's got a zoom lens on it. Um, so on the right hand side there you can see you can see the two boards that I'm working on uh, when I'm doing the work for the alloy uh, board. Now on the right hand side you've got the Kaluga development board which is from Expressive themselves. That's the ESP 32S2 board. Uh, you can see the module uh, down there on the base of that and then all the IO pins. And then on the left hand side you've got the lattice um, what do they call this one they call it the ice 40 ultra plus breakout board um, it has the uh, up 5k ice 40 up 5k on it which is one i need to program um, and i've had lots of fun with that actually this week um, i totally forgot that I hadn't set up uh, this board to work so I've not used this board before um, and I was just going to use Windows subsystem for Linux but of course um, it's not quite that simple um, Windows subsystem for Linux has very limited USB support it just has uh, primarily like uh, serial USB so I can use COM ports and stuff and virtual Comports, but on the um, the lattice size 40 breakout board, they have an FTDI chip, um, so you have to install all the drivers. That, but you've got to be careful because you, in order to use the open tools, you don't just install the normal FTDI drivers. What you need to do is you need to install the open source lib um, lib USB support. So that was quite interesting. Um, I also got a chance to um, let me see if I can remember what it's called. I downloaded because normally I do everything in Windows Subsystem for Linux for all of the FPGA open source tooling. Um, but in this case, um, I used. Um, I wanted to use some tooling that actually works in Windows directly rather than Windows subsystem for Linux. So let me just switch back. 
Um, in fact, can I add myself to this one? That would be good. Do, 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 do. Let me put myself back into this. Bear with me. Making it up as I go along. Video that one ah, it's not letting him pick that up that's annoying I'm here. How do I get rid of this other one? Right. So, um, one of the things I had to use, hold on. Let's see where I got this. Um, Hope this doesn't start um, notifying and beeping, but uh, this is one of the. Um, I can get this from Peter's one of Peter's channels on Discord. Bear with me. What is it called? Just open this link. Sorry, guys, I should be more organised about this one. So, what I used on Windows to get the tools up and running. Am I showing the right camera now, my friend? You should see me in the bottom corner along with the boards. Dun, 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 dun. So what I've been using is something called um, the FPGA tool chain, which is a great... This is on GitHub. Uh, it's Ed Bordings. He's put together all of the various different pieces of the puzzle. Um, it includes Yosis. Uh, it also includes GHDL Yosis plugin and GHDL command line tools, but on, not on Windows for those two because there's a Linux only Symbiosis. So it's got all of the formal provers and all of that stuff in. Uh, including Bulecta, Yices 2, Z3, any ones you don't recognise there are probably part of the formal things for Yosis and Symbiosis. Project Trellis, 
which has the lattice ECP5 bitstream and XPFR. And um, Project iStorm, Next PNR, DFU Util, ECP Prog, uh, which is a basic driver for FTDI based JTAG Pro to program the ECP5 FPGA. So I haven't used that. And Open FPGA Loader, again, I haven't used that either. So, anyhow, I installed that on Windows. So I've actually been able to use the tools directly under the Windows command line in using the, uh, the these tools that have been cross-compiled for Windows. So if you need to get the tools on your system, this is quite a neat way of doing it. It effectively creates a directory of all the binaries in that you need, and you just need to add that binary to your path. And it works for Windows. It works for... Um, Linux and Mac so it's a lot better than when I last looked in terms of getting the tools onto your system um, I can probably show you what that looks like so for example if I do let me just get our Windows app up this I hope this isn't too um so let me just share this window temporarily and we'll see what I mean. So I'm just using a Windows PowerShell here. Um, so if I go into the directory that you create, um, you have a look in there. Some of that stuff I've added myself, like the examples. So I've just got some examples from the Black Ice because I needed a, like a Blink example to play with. But all of the stuff you need is in bin. So if you look at that, you've got all of the executables, Windows executables. The only ones that you don't have there that it mentions are the ones to do with GHDL because that's a native Linux application. GHDL is, is basically a HDL tool written for Linux using GNOME. And obviously you can't easily run GNOME on Windows. So um, that's obviously not included. It does also say that you can use the Linux version of this if you want to download for Windows subsystem for Linux. And they do a separate download, which is just the uh, upload tools for running natively on Windows. Um, in here, what does it call those? That's, um, again, because I didn't really use it because I've used ICE for so long now, I'd forgotten all about half of these. ICE PROG. So if you look in that directory, you've got something called ICE PROG. Um, now, ICE PROG expects to talk to an FTDI device using LibUSB. So there's a very specific way of installing that, not using the FTDI drivers, but using a third party. And literally you run that executable you then point it at the ftdi devices device or devices because often you get more than one pop up on your usb it comes up as more than one device and then uh, it, it associates the uh, lib usb drivers which are then compatible with this so it was kind of fun getting that working so that i could actually program the lattice ice breakout board because I hadn't done that in such a long time. Um, and I needed to have a binary that I knew worked before I could do any of the subsequent work uh, on these these boards. Um, so again, just looking back at these two boards, so all I'm doing here, the, all I've set up for the moment is I have um, Circuit Python uh, actually installed on the Kaluga board. Uh, so that's actually in Flash. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar with the CircuitPython, I can probably um, 
give you a small overview of that and why we're doing that in a minute. Just just shout if you want to hear that and I'll, um, I'll give you a quick overview. Um, so the connections between the two boards, these flying leads here, are really just the um, uh, SPI pins from the Kaluga board to the lattice board. So the orange one here is actually for the reset. That resets the ICE 40 chip or enables me to reset it, pull it down into reset mode. You need to do that before you program it. And then the other three pins are basically um, the SPI clock, uh, the SPI uh, serial out from the Kaluga serial in to the ICE 40. And then the third wire, which I think is the yellow one in this case, that is the um, SS pin on the ICE 40, which is used both as a chip select when you're programming it over S SPI, um, so it's a chip select in, or it's used as a chip select output when it's loading itself from flash. So um, all I was going to do is at some point I just need to get some software written that enables me to program it directly um, from the from the Kaluga board. Still not seeing your screen. Ah, okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. Ta -da! So that's the listing um, of the FPGA toolchain, the subdirectory, the binary, but be it bin directory of uh, the FPGA tools. Have they been downloaded? That may be a bit small. I wonder if I can. Ooh, it's not easy to do that. Uh, hold on. Hmm. No, it's not letting me do that. It's a shame. I was hoping to uh, make the text larger. So the, the reason for this arrangement, let me just remind you again, let me just switch back to the CAD. Well, that's very odd. It thinks that PowerShell is my WSL terminal. Right, let's turn that off. Okay, so just to remind you, um, that's the board. I'll come back to that in a sec. Let me just bring the schematic up so you can see uh, what's going on here. Let me bring that to the front if I can. Uh, okay. So in particular, what I want to be able to do here is look at signals between these two so um, on the left hand side here of the alloy board you have the ESP 32 s2 microcontroller um, there on the left it's strange it doesn't show the cursor on it that's annoying so on the left hand side uh, and you can actually see the pinouts for the ESP32 and on the left hand of that you see the BIO3 underscore BS BIO0 B clock BIO1 etc. These are all part of the eight line eight 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 bit uh, or octo SPI, but I'm only using a few of these effectively. So those um, from BIO0, BClock, BS, 
MBIO1, I believe, connect over. So if you look on the right hand side at the ICE 40 here, ah, my cursor's back, great. Uh, you can see these come into um, the SPI. BS comes into the select, SPI select, the B clock comes into the SPI SCK, BIO0 comes into the SPI serial in, which is in programming, and then we've got a serial out as well, but we kind of ignore that. Now, with the ICE40 series of chips, they all use a fairly standard way of being programmed, rather than having JTAG or something like that you actually use SPI and the process is relatively simple. Um, you literally put the chip into reset. Uh, you then take the CS pin low to activate it. You then put in a load of ones or zeros and a whole bunch of clock cycles basically to clear out whatever's in randomized in, in the SPI section. You then release the CS, you then release the reset, and then you can actually, you have to pause a bit, wait for the done signal to assert itself, which in this case is active low, I believe. No, it does actually pull itself up. And then you, you're free to program it. And literally what we do on Black Ice since the very early days is we serialize uh, the binary file that's produced um, by the open source FPGA tools. Um, we actually, when, when we open the file, we actually skim through the first bit until we um, hit a signature of hex, a uh, series of, of bytes. Uh, I think there's about four bytes in a row that are very uh, that are consistent uh, so we ignore everything before that and then there's a process that we have to go through uh, we do I think eight clock cycles first then we reproduce that signature and then copy the rest of the binary file byte by byte and then at the end we have to do a whole bunch of flushes um, now included in the binary is a CRC as well. And if the transfer is, if the ICE 40 is happy with what it's received and the CRC adds up, uh, it will put that into, um, it will actually implement the bit file, which is a mixture of setting the muxes up to get the FPGA circuit that you want, but it also parts of that binary may contain contents for the block memory. So it will put that into into the memory as well. And then if it's happy with everything, it effectively starts the logic up uh, that's just been put, just been programmed into it. And then if you're lucky, it will assert the, uh, the done pin, uh, which you can see pin seven on the bottom here so we can actually look for that normally what you have is a, a an LED on the board which will display the status of that but it, it, in the case of um, black ice we'd also read that into the microcontroller so we know whether we've been successful or not because it's kind of useful to know uh, that it was successful particularly if you've got a program running on the STM32 that has to talk to the stuff it needs to know that it's actually engaged so that's the bit that I've got to do a Python version of is that programming bit. But as I say, I do have code for that already in C. So um, I've been through that exercise a number of times in the past. That so should be relatively easy. So the reason that we've got those boards set up in that way, let me just switch back. Let me get rid of the power shell. We don't need that. So we're, we're actually simulating what we're going to have on the board using these two development kits. So on the right hand side we've got the Kaluga 
uh, development kit which has on it the very same chip that we're using on the Ally board which is basically an ESP32 S2 and then on the left hand side we've got a development board for the ICE 45K which is the chip that we've also got on the board and then the uh, wiring between them is really just emulating uh, those four wires or five wires between between the two devices including ground as well there. So that's what that setup's for. Going back, so um, I should probably just do a, um, let's just go through the news and bits and bobs and let's just actually go back to uh, the CAD. I haven't changed it much since you last saw it. Let me just promote that window for the layout. Bring that to the fore. <clears throat> so those who were watching the previous streams um, you probably wouldn't notice much difference here the only thing I've really done that's changed I mean this is going to be dynamic anyhow there's going to be changes um, as we go along particularly if I start finding some issues that I have to fix on the board but the main changes probably since last week is I've changed the uh, just a reminder for those that haven't seen this before. So the format of this particular board, um, I'm actually working on more than one board, more than one MyStorm board at the moment. But this particular board is a departure from the normal MyStorm boards. Um, and I'll get into that a bit later. But the format of this particular board is uh, what's called a feather format. Um, if anyone's familiar with Adafruit, they introduced the Feather uh, format on their own products uh, several years ago. They now have a um, slightly loose specification for it. Uh, there are some things that you have to do, there are some things that you don't have to do in order to uh, be Feather compatible, so to speak. But it's a, it's a, it's a neat little format. Um, what you see... You just isolate it. One one of the weird things it 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 it, it, it has a battery uh, JST two mil spaced connector on it for a start, which is quite a big connector on this. But it they wanted to make it easier for when people are using batteries and battery equipment rather than just everything being USB powered. So in order to support the Feather standard, not only do you need that uh, JST connector so that you can plug the you know, like a lipo battery and a small lipo battery but you also need the charger chip uh, which which is here um, so that will charge over usb which is kind of nice really um, little built-in feature um, so that's a key feature of the uh, feather you also need to have usb that's an important part of the spec uh, the other thing is you need these headers um, so if we look at the bottom here, these are 0.1 spaced headers. Um, the, some of these pins are very specific. So you've got a reset pin. That's fairly standard. That resets the microcontroller on the board. You've got a 3 volt plus 3 volt supply pin. Uh, you've then got a, um, a pin which can be, it's not compulsory. Uh, it can be um, the VREF pin the analog voltage in this case uh, I'm using this as a reset out pin so in other words the reset that I'm sending to the FPGA I regenerate that here and pass this out in this pin so normally this will be up at 3 volt free anyhow so if you're using it as a VREF that's fine not only that it has a good filter on it in terms of a, a 10k um, resistor and a 100 uh, nanofarad capacitor so it's actually quite stable but you can use it as an AREF if you need to but again, it's not a compulsory pin um, on the Feather standard. Ground is the next pin along. That is compulsory. And then you normally have your analog pins, six of them. So A0 through to A5 here. Again, not all of their boards have analog pins. One of the early boards that they did was an ESP8266, which is based on the 8266 module from Expressive. Now, if anyone's looked at that in the early days, uh, given that that was really the first of these Wi-Fi chips that Expressive produced, um, it was fairly limited. 
It doesn't have many IOs. Most of the IOs have pre-assigned tasks like SPI, UART, TX, and RX, and that kind of thing. Uh, and it only has one analog pin. So it's very limited. Um, so obviously, when they did their featherboard for this, most of these pins are what are called NC, not connected, because um, they just didn't have the analog pins for that. But if you do have analog support, you should include them here. They also recommend that you do them in the order that the analog ascends in terms of registers as well. But they do try and indicate that A0 and A1, if you have DACs shared with ADCs, the first two should have the DACs in, which I followed. But again, that's just a recommendation. It's not, not the whole thing. Uh, then moving along, the other thing that you need to have, which is a requirement, is the SPI free SPI pins. So you need the clock, you need the uh, output slash serial in from the peripheral point of view, and then you need the input uh, into the board or the output from the serial uh, peripheral. Um, the other thing you need is a UART, so you have a receive and a transmit pin. And then you have an optional pin. Uh, this optional pin can be connected to ground or it can be an I.O. pin. In this case, um, this is actually connected to the chip select for the SD card, which sits on the underside of this board. You can't see it. Um, so if you're not using the SD card, for whatever reason you don't need it, you could reuse that pin optionally if you like. So those are fairly standard pins, obviously, on the feather. And then on the top, you've got some other standard pins. So the first pin on the top here is the V bat pin. So that's the battery voltage, battery supply. You then have an enable pin. Enable pin's a bit weird, but basically uh, that enables this board to effectively be powered down. Um, then you have the 5 volt pin. Well, really, that's USB pin. Uh, so that's the voltage from the USB. And then you have effectively any number of digital pins. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you have the I squared C pins. So you must provide the I squared C, SCL, and SGA. Uh, and you can optionally provide the digital pins at the top. In this case here, um, not only are these digital pins, they're also analog pins. So in other words, depending on how you set the software up on this particular microcontroller, they can be analog or digital. So for the moment, I've just given these analog labels as well, just to help clarify that. The D0 isn't analog. The D0 is actually a special pin on this particular board because that's actually connected to uh, the boot slash mode pin. Um, that enables you to change the way that this is uh, booted up um, on the microcontroller, the way that the flash is used and stuff. So you have to be a bit more careful about using that pin. So that's the tour of the standard uh, pins on the feather. The, um, the spacing between these is 0 0.8 inches or 800 mils. Uh, all the dimensions Adafruit are American, so it's all Imperial. Um, and a lot of it's based around the 0.1 pitch of the pins. The whole board width is 900 mil um, height in, in, the, in this diagram. So um, normally what you just have is a microcontroller on the feather. So we've covered all the standards, all the bases there. But the other thing that we're doing here, we don't just have a microcontroller. We have an FPGA as well. Um, oh, before I go on, so the microcontroller we're using, um, you may not be familiar with. Uh, Expressive produced the 8266 a number of years ago, which is a Wi Fi based mi microcontroller. They use a chip in uh, a microcore inside core from Extensor, which is licensed from Extensor. It's a 32 bit microcontroller. Um, more recently, they brought out the ESP32, which is a 32 bit version that has much better memory and flash, etc. Um, the problem I always had, I always wanted to use one of these because of the Wi-Fi features that it offers. 
um, but they never had USB and you always need USB you know USB is really really useful every time I talk to people about um, the FPGA boards they always want USB you must have USB to be able to program it etc and they like the USB for debugging and all sorts of other things so it, I'd looked at this a lot, an awful lot of times and I just could not um, get it done in a neat way because I always had to add another chip to the filler materials that hooked up the UART to um, to USB like um, you know a CHP um, virtual USB UART port or a, you know certainly not an FTDI one so very expensive edition but it's more items on the bill of materials so I kind of put it off and put it off and put it off and then finally um, Expressive have brought out this new ESP 32-S2 and the S2 actually has an OTG uh, USB built in so they've licensed the USB hardware and built it into the microcontroller so we now have USB, great, so we can use it. So I finally get to use um, one of Express's microcontrollers. So it's really exciting from that point of view. So you've got Wi-Fi as well. In fact, there's an antenna here, which is a three-dimensional ceramic antenna. Um, I can show you those later. I actually got some of those today. So the other cool bit um, about this is the FPGA. So here we have the ICE 40 FPGA chip uh, which you don't normally get with a feather so in order to offer the pins out for that um, I've added these headers uh, you can add to the right hand side of a feather so you can extend it that way but you must keep that side fairly standard that's the way that they build in flexibility so they allow you to add pins that way but not the other way so in this case, I've added a 16-bit or two rows of eight, 0.1-inch header here that has 16 um, FPGA I/O pins on it. And in addition, I've added a single, sorry, a double P mod on the end here. And the reason I put that on as well is because sometimes it's just convenient to plug in. A small PMOD extension. These are getting really popular now. The PMODs. I mean, if you, if you've seen the black ice, you'll know we have lots of these on the black ice boards. Uh, clearly, we don't have room on a feather for lots of these, but we do have room for one double one. So we can put our short, nifty little PMODs in there, which is kind of useful. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can actually have. Um, uh, what's called a feather wing board so it's like a carrier board that this will plug into that exposes the feather wing so you can put multiple feather compatible devices in uh, that have the same pinouts of, as these those are called feather wings but in our case we also break out the other pins and we can break out the FPGA pins uh, not just into a single uh, sorry double P mod but into um, basically a um, mix mod which is something that we use on that we introduce with the black ice mx so the mix mod is like two of the p mods side by side and then six pins in between which include five volt ground and four analog signals so it's a mixed signal expansion that's com backward compatible with p mods which is kind of cool so i do have um a design for those feathers as well and I ordered that as part of the um, JL PCB order that I did um, was it last week or the week before I forget now week before so the FPGA pins are built on here what you can't see on this board uh, if I can just turn it on briefly is what's on the underside Yeah, that's not very clear. Um, basically, up this end, you have an SD card, which is also attached via SBI to the ESP32S2. Uh, so that's kind of useful for logging, storing uh, binary images. You know, if you've got multiple binary images for games or something, 
that you want to load into the FPGA. That's quite handy. And then under this area here is a um, FPC connector on the base of the board. Now the FPC connector will en enable you to connect to something like an OVR 2640 or 7650, is it? They're very common. Uh, they're on the end of uh, small FPC cables. It's a parallel port effectively. You've got an eight eight lane, eight, eight bit data interface and you've got a pixel clock, horizontal and vertical sinks. Um, and then you have to provide it with a base clock as well, which we do. Uh, and some voltages. Um, we supply it with 3 volt 3, 2 volt 5, and 1.2 volts. Uh, luckily, we were using what we were already using on the board because the uh, FPGA needs a 1.2 volt as its VCC, and we also need the uh, 2 volt 5 for the programming, which we generate by dropping down the 3 volt 3. So that's what's on the bottom. So, um, about I think it's 11 or 12 pins are allocated from the FPGA to talk to the camera. But the good thing about that is it means that uh, later on when we get the uh, HDL done, we'll be able to do process camera stuff in the FPGA and just pass on the relevant information to the microcontroller. Because um, the trouble is when you have these cameras connected to microcontrollers, the microcontrollers are just completely tied up. They can't do anything else. Um, it's a really heavy duty thing for the microcontroller to have to deal with processing camera stuff. So if you can pre-process using uh, HDL, you know, you, inside the FPGA, that's, that's a really useful feature to have. So that's a quick whiz around. Uh, and the big changes I made, I think from last time is I changed the header types to give us more room and I labeled up the headers so you can actually see what's on the connectors and stuff. And I just neatened a few things up. We've also got a few LEDs. On the left hand side here is a status LED which is driven by the microcontroller. Um, on the bottom right here we've got some red, yellow, green LEDs. You'll be familiar with those from Black Ice. On Black Ice you have a dish one which is a blue one. But in this case they're, they're connected to the RGB or open drain outputs of the FPGA as well which are also on this header. So that's kind of useful to have um for just um playing around with your um hdl for example and there's a couple of buttons here one just resets the whole thing the second one uh can be used on boot up to put the esp32 into a certain state or it can be used as a user button when it's already booted up which is kind of handy um it's all a bit crowded quite frankly squeezing everything in it's going to be fun to assemble this couple of other things, um, I probably would have mentioned this in the previous ones, but for those that missed the previous ones, these two chips at the bottom, IC7 and IC8, let me just turn off the underside, that's not helping my view. Yeah, yeah so IC7 and IC8 um, are the um, Quad SPI ROM and Quad SPI Flash. Quad SPI ROM enables us to load in um, the program um, that may be running on the ESP32 for example um, it's read-only memory but we can flash it from the microcontroller itself um, in addition when we're using circuit python uh, when you plug it in it comes up as a drive or a partition of that flash actually comes up as a drive and you use that to edit the code that you're running on i'll come back to that and the uh, the PS RAM in the other Quad SPI chip, pseudo RAM, um, is 64 megabit. That's quite a lot, and uh, eight megabytes. Um, and you can use that when you're running Circuit Python. That gets used for the heap. Now, bear in mind when you're running Python, you know you're, you're consuming generally a great deal more memory. And a lot less efficiently than you would do in C. I know we're using C Python. Uh, most of the way that it talks to the peripherals underneath are written in C and it's calling into those. Um, that's the way it works. Circuit Python is based on MicroPython and it's a bit like C Python uh, for those uh, familiar with that. 
Uh, Laurie Griffiths is just saying uh, the OV7670 needs I squared C to configure it as well. That's correct. They're all the same. The OV2640 uh, or 50 requires that as well. So I use the SDA, uh, SDA and STL from the um, microcontroller for that because they're good at that. I hate doing I squared C on uh, FPGA. It's a pain in the ass. And the implementations, the I know there are IP parts inside the FPGA for I squared C, but um, there's all sorts of issues with it. Okay, so DSP 8 but is there an SRAM or SDRAM for buffering samples, by the way? Uh, the MCU and the FPGA. So inside that FPGA is uh, about 128k in terms of memory blocks. So that's what's used. It's also got DSPs inside it as well. So unlike the Black Ice, which is based on the HX 8K, uh, the Ice 40 are based on what they call the Ultra Plus uh series um let me see if i can pull up the url for you guys and then you can have a look so that you can actually see what you're looking at here do, 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 do. There you go. Um, so basically, the Ultra Plus have a few really nice bits and bobs. Um, if you look at the specification there, you'll see uh, the number of lookup tables you get on this particular device. This is a QFN 48 chip package. It's, the, it's called the UP 5K, uh, and it has 5,280 lookup um lookup tables in it which is more than the official number that were in the black ice which was based on a 4k chip even though it does have 8k inside it really um it has um Basically, a thousand and twenty four kilobits is about 128 meg, uh, 128k byte. Um, and it has some block RAM as well as the SP RAM inside it, which is kind of nice. So, we don't necessarily need to add uh, chips, which is good, it makes it simpler. Given where I'm aiming this particular board at, having to deal with things like SD RAM would be exceptionally difficult and probably beyond the scope what most people could cope with in this area uh, it's also got one pll it's got an i squared c core in fact it's got two um, but again i don't like those and there are bugs with that uh, the spi core it's got two spi cores it's got an internal 10 kilohertz and a 48 uh, megahertz internal oscillator although i am taking a line from the esp32 clock out just like we did with the ice 40 um, sorry, the, the black ice we took from the STM32, we took a clock out. So we'll have a that will probably run at, I think I'm going to run it at 24 megahertz. I need to double check that because I think I might also supply that to the camera and it likes 24 megahertz. Um, it's got these DSP blocks, eight of them, which is kind of nice, which is a 16 by 16 multiplying 32 bit accumulator. And it has a few special pins for driving LEDs and stuff. So it's a great little chip for those who are not familiar with it. Um, probably the best thing about it is it's in a very compact package. Being in a QFM 48 means I can stick it on something like a feather. You know, that would be unimaginable with the HX uh, 8K or 4K chips, which tend to come in the big TQFP 100s and large BGAs, etc.
I am trying to look at it, Ed. It's just very small. I need to find a way of getting it bigger and then I can see it easier, the chat. Um, the Up 5K has enough RAM to run the NES, says Laurie Griffiths. Cool. I did part of that um, on the Icebreaker. Yeah, the Icebreaker uses the same chip as this one. Cool. I promise to pay attention, Ed. Honest. I'm looking at the chat. I just got to work out how to make the letters bigger. That would be nice. I can't do the old no. standard key. Right. Okay. Oh, we've got quite a few viewers now. That's nice. Um, those that are not, not subscribed, please do. The more subscribers I get, if I get a certain number, they'll actually let me keep my streams on their servers, which is good. So, uh, and you can get a chance to chat, not just lurk, which is always fun. I don't bite. Well, not much so um, that's really the state of play with that board there haven't been many other changes from that so what you're looking at now is actually a more a, a later version of the design uh, than I ordered so um, the boards won't have even the correct name on it we had this issue with the name um, etc so that's that so let me give you the rest of the news so importantly there's some really good bits of news uh first one is da, 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 da. can't see that very well because it's got the plastic on let me get it off Um, if you if you use Osh Stencil in the States, they tend to send you much smaller ones, which are a bit more convenient, really. But this size is the smallest that you can get from JL um, PCB. So it's going to be fun getting a look at that. I wonder if you can actually see. Let me just try and switch views. Bear with me. I wonder if I'll be able to see this on here. Hmm. Now, I can't seem to get it on that camera. Okay, we just have to make do with this. So, let me get the light right. You can probably just see that is the stencil for Alloy. Da -da -da -da. Both sides. So that's good news. That arrived, as did the boards. <clears throat> There we go. That's the board. Let me switch to a bigger view. Come on. Autofocus. There we go. That's the board. And can you see the name? That has the old name. We've been through two names already. Started off as Bitflip. It was very briefly called Icicle, as it says on here. And of course, it's in the wonderful matte black. Although you can't actually see much of the black. And yeah, Ed, the. Um, that stencil is for the front and the back, so there's two parts to it. But yeah, it's huge. Uh, and then the back of the board. Uh, let's see if we can get the focus on there. Come on. I didn't want to focus on that. It's very strange. Too close.
Wow. That's strange. My face is in the way, perhaps. Come on. So on here, you can see just the SD card. Space for the SD card. And there we go, at last. And it's upside down. Of course it is. I don't know why it's sometimes so slow. There we go. And then the other thing is the connector there for the FPC cable for the camera. So hurrah! We have board. However, we don't have all the components, which is annoying. It was actually really strange. These boards came well before I expected them by four days, four days earlier than I expected. Not only that, but the order for the um, um, for the components caught me out as well so the you know I have this one this little thin pack of stuff I don't normally order that much from uh, LCSC uh, they're based out of um, China or Hong Kong but um, they were unbelievably quick I can't believe how quickly these came so both the PCBs and these came really quickly. Um, but I couldn't get everything from one place. Um, so some of the things that I couldn't get from elsewhere that I had to get from LCSC are things like the pseudo RAM, you know, the Quad SPI RAM. Um, can't find those for love, no money over here in, or in the US. Mauser, DigiKey, Farnell, Mars, they don't sell them. So you have to go to these guys and they're good pricing for some things, not all things for some things. So they're pretty good pricing. Um, I also re received some of the um, connectors as well, which was good that I just done from AliExpress, which I quite often do things like these just saves me having to cut and butcher headers. I get the right size um, those go with the board which I'll show you in a minute um, and extraordinarily the things I ordered from Mauser i.e. US stroke UK supplier took twice as long to arrive so it's completely um, also in place these are interesting get the focus these are the antennas don't know if that's going to focus on these. Probably not. They're only teeny tiny. You look at the size of my nail. Uh, and I got those from Mauser because I couldn't find these particular ones. Um, in LCLS. And also, Here's a weird thing. The ESP S2s from Expressive, which you think would be better priced, you know, from uh, the Asian suppliers, but it's not. They were more expensive from the Asian suppliers than they were from either Mauser or Digikey. So go figure. So whenever you're buying stuff, always look around. It's not always what you expect. Often, you know, it's cheaper to buy from one supplier or another. Don't just automatically buy from one supplier. But you do have to watch the shipping fees. You've got to order enough so that you get either free shipping or you're going to pay for the shipping anyhow because you have to get it from a certain supplier. So those arrive. So these headers, these are the female ones. 
those and these that's the two by eight and these are all for receiving the feather because they go on the other board which arrived which is just something I quickly knocked up to make it easier when I come to do the testing because the feather board's pretty small so let me see can I get this to focus in here it's playing up today our camera it's not playing ball is it Come on. so this board if it ever focuses Oh, I don't know what's up with this camera today. <sighs> Being a nightmare. One more go. And I'll give up showing you. So this is just like a feather wing carrier board, if you like, that I've knocked up. So this plugs into the center oh it focuses on that and the center here and then i can fit the feather wings either side and then it has a connector at the top which i can add a a mix mod in And again, it has the icicle name on it. Don't! Oh! Before we realise we have to rename it. And I've got a power terminal on there. Uh, a battery connector, because you may not be able to get to that if you put the uh, feather in the middle. Um, I've even got a newer version of this being designed as well that also has what they call the stemmer connectors on which are like um, mini JST connectors like I think uh, point one, they're one mil or t there's a two mil version as well that just have um, I squared C expansion on yeah I, I, thanks Ed Ed's suggesting I try and use a piece of paper behind it um, let's give it a go I wonder if that makes any difference actually hi trouble is if I'm careful I can't actually see it properly it still doesn't like this board Ed I don't know what it is about this board <laughs> but it really doesn't like it maybe if I get it far enough away it will there we go and then I can bring it in closer. Good idea, Ed. That works. Thank you. So I've got those boards as well, which is great. So I, I can once I get to the uh, feather working, um, I will uh, be able to use that. Uh, something else I got. Let me see what these are. And give you an individual one it's probably a bit small to see very small baby 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 things I bet it won't focus on this because it's tiny not with me in the background USB-C's so I'm having a look at those because that's still one of the ongoing questions is should I go with a USB-C? As you can see on the current design, um, just to remind you, uh, here we have just a regular micro USB, not USB-C. So I'm still considering the possibility of using USB-C on those. 
So it's really good news. So I've got the boards. I've got virtually all the components. Um, I'm still waiting for a couple of bits that unfortunately were coming from Ali, which are the buttons. And I still haven't had the JST connectors, which is annoying. Um, I'm hoping to get those in the next day or two, fingers crossed. Then I can actually start putting that board together uh, and testing it. So that's the status of those boards, um, which is good progress. I got the stuff sooner than I thought. I didn't think it would be ready for this, this stream anyhow. Um, that's that. What else have I got here? So my new camera is working, as I pointed out. That's kind of useful. What I don't have on the new camera, which is awkward, is this, the way that the camera is designed, it doesn't have any mounting point on it. Normally with a camera, you have like a uh a threaded what is it an m3 or something 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 like that will screw into it it looks huge obviously because it's very close it's actually quite small it's like an m3 m4 you normally screw that in so if i have a camera like this for example if you look at the bottom you can normally just screw that in uh, and then this fits onto um, something that I attach to the shelf, and I can change the height and stuff of that. So what I did was I got a um, like a clamp, sprung clamp, and that kind of holds onto the camera, but it's a bit dodgy, and it gets in the way of the lens adjustments. And I'm doing the focus. Uh, I'm probably either going to have to take the camera unit apart, drill a hole in, and add a threaded receiver for this in, or I'm going to have to 3D print something, find some way of fitting something on. At the moment, it's kind of sitting in in the claw that I have attached to it, which just kind of holds it there. Um, and we will be using that more. So when I'm doing the work on the different boards and stuff, maybe I could do some soldering, show some of the stencil pasting, that kind of thing, when I'm ready. Um, I don't know what size it is, Ed. Photography is not my thing, but I'm sure it's standard. So is that Imperial? Could well be. I don't have my um don't think I have anything handy to all measure it. First came across this on a Russian camera. Mm, different Empire, same units. Interesting. Yeah, I know it's fairly common, but I couldn't tell you its dimensions. I could measure it if I could find my tools, but I can't. I don't know where I put that. So anyhow, so the new camera's up temporarily uh, i'd like to say it's mounted but that wouldn't be a fair description it's kind of in a gravity assisted relatively stable position albeit slightly awkward um okay so something else i wanted to talk about then i'm glad i've got a few viewers um where do i start So Alloy is really very much a, a branch left, my left, you're right. 
and it's very specifically designed to explore an entirely different area to black ice yes there's an fpga yes there's a microcontroller there's lots of familiar pieces in there that look very similar to black ice and my storm boards of the past but uh the alloy board has very much has an attitude uh, as i pointed out in previous streams it is aimed directly at some fairly specific tool sets and software so it's narrow doesn't mean that you can't use the other stuff with it um, so for example I'm not targeting Verilog tools per se with this the first port of call would be in Mygen. that will be the tool that I will be using for the examples etc for this and the reason that I'm using that is it's because it's Python based the entire tool set will be Python based so that's why we're running originally I was going to look at running uh, MicroPython but the S2 support isn't in MicroPython yet so um, I spent quite a bit of time looking at what Adafruit and Scott has been porting CircuitPython which is Adafruit's version of um, microcontroller Python if you like or CPython but Scott has ported this he, the CircuitPython platform over onto the S2 and he's been doing it a, a, quite a few live streams I, I recommend you watch if you really want to see what's going on with CircuitPython watch his deep dives so if you go, go and look up on Twitch Adafruit or even on YouTube because actually put their streams on both you, you, you will find in there deep dive Scott's deep dives and Scott is a lead developer for CircuitPython and he's doing some great stuff it's really interesting and if you want some insight into that take a look you don't have to understand all the inning gubbins etc in order to use it so tool wise you'll be able to use Python um, the reason for doing that is you can use the Python to write your code that orchestrates what's going on on the alloy and also write the code for the models for the FPGA the hardware description language is done within Python as well so you can create a unified Python uh, interface for the two that's my plan um, and it just makes it easier for people coming to FPGAs for the first time uh, which is entirely what this is about is you know making that learning curve less steep so that's alloy now the other thing i've started work on is a new version of sorry black edge is also being worked on i'm not covering that today i will cover that i've said i'll cover that in later streams um I'm waiting on some software before I make some decisions to go ahead with the black edge stuff um, that's quite mature at this point but it's just not ready for public consumption yet the ice the black ice board however um, I won't be manufacturing any more of those as they are currently designed and the reason for that I mean I've still got stock so it will keep us going for a while but the reason that I'm making this change is because um, if you look at the pricing of the various different lattice chips and the pricing I can get for different things, then uh, it's difficult to justify sticking with the HX series because the the high end on the ice 40 is overlaps with low end on the ecp5 so designing another board another black ice based around the hx uh, 8k or 4k chip doesn't make a great deal of sense um, there are some issues if you go with the ecp5 route and i don't want to do an ecp5 black ice um there's a number of issues with it one of which is the name 
I'm not using ice anymore. If it's ECB5, it's not ice. So the kind of the naming doesn't make much sense anymore if I go that route. Um, and I'm already doing ECP5 based work with Black Edge anyhow. So, you know, kind of repurposing that into a Black Ice type format doesn't make sense when you've already got Black Edge underway. Um, not only that, because ECP5 is BGA, you need, I have to go to six layers. Um, and that puts the price of Black Ice up considerably so even if i could get over the naming uh economically it doesn't make a great deal of sense so one of the things i've been thinking about is what do i do moving forward with black ice because i like the black ice market i like the name um it's known i'd like to continue the series but it's going to need to be something different so let me open something here and show you what i think I will do next I haven't got a decent name for this yet so at the moment um, it's just called let me see if I can zoom in on this if I make that window a bit bigger maybe we just change this grid to something smaller Have we gone too big? Um, bear with me a second. Should be clear enough. So this is one of the early proposals for the for the moment it's called Black Eyes 5 or Black Eyes V. Um, DSP 8-bit. I love Black Eyes. Thank you, DSP 8-bit. So do I. I use it all the time. I <laughs> uh, hope you can evolve the series to something else great. That's my hope as well. So one of the things that I wanted to do with it is given the constraints I have is I'd really like to get the pricing down. We kind of, uh, over the years, the price has kind of crept up from the original My Storm board and the Black Ice one. So it's an opportunity to reset that bit for a price point. So I want to make it lower cost. Um, that means being a bit more um, optimizing the bill of materials, really. That's what that means. So in this representation here, how do we get as much value as we can in black ice fashion? um with the best possible component but minimal component count so let me talk around here so in order to come up with this design what i did was i looked back over the evolution from the original my storm board for those that may remember it it was actually called my storm um which we then used as a community, you know, label later. And we introduced the black ice labeling for the boards because we figured we'd do different boards. So I look back through the history of that and I thought, well, what was good in the past? What did people like, etc. So there's a bit of bit of retro in here for some of the things that people like. Uh, and unlike the alloy, which really appeals to a new kind of audience, Python oriented, etc., this is very much back uh, where we initially saw the black ice. Not the MyStorm so much, because MyStorm 
lent very heavily the original one on, on Raspberry Pi, whereas Black Ice didn't. It still had the connector there, but it, it didn't require it in any way, shape or form. So one of the things that it did do uh, that people liked and have subsequently missed is having the Arduino headers. Um, I'm sure some people will probably, yes, I'll probably hear some people groan. No, not Arduino headers, please. But why not put them on there? Um, and the way that we historically used the Arduino headers was we used it to break out the microcontroller. GPI pins, GPIOs, and comms pins like SPI, UART, I squared C, etc. Those standard pins, as well as some analog pins, because um, you want to use as much as you've got on the board. You want to leverage all of the features on the board to be able to do different things. Um, and the other thing that people quite liked and some of the earlier boards was being able to use the Arduino environment. So again, uh, I'd like to see the board files actually support that again, because we have we lapsed? I guess we've lapsed on the Arduino front. Now you'll have to forgive me here because I'm not an Arduino user. I don't have those skills. Uh, the last Arduino library support that we had um, was actually done by Richard, Richard Miller. No doubt I will be knocking again on Richard's door. Um, I will take what he, he did last time and probably work with that. But I, I'm probably going to have some questions anyhow. So when we look back at that, we used the STM32 L433 series, which is the low powered M4. And again, I want it low powered because that's kind of nice. I mean, the ice 40 is a low power FPGA anyhow. So some people use it in those applications and want to be able to squeeze as much as they can out. For a given amount of power, particularly if you're going to operate in environments that may be, you know, like solar panels and stuff like that. Um, so we've gone with the on, on this design. I've gone with the STM thirty two L four three three again. Um, Ken and I loved that chip when we put it in the original. It was a black ice. Two. It was definitely in the Black Ice 2. I think it was in the original Black Ice as well. Don't quote. Well, in fact, on the original MyStorm board, I think we had a STM32103. One of the very first boards. And then we had the STM32... L475, I think it was. It was quite an expensive M4. Uh, and then I think we eventually settled on the... STM32L433, um, which is the low powered ARM Cortex M4. So it has the floating point unit, which this has as well, obviously, being an L433. The difference here is we're using the 48 pin package rather than the 64 pin because we don't need all the extra pins. And again, I want to get the bomb down, I want to get the cost down. So um, this was the economical route. So there's just enough pins to cover those Arduino headers. Um, so we've got digital IOs on the top, including SPI UARTs um, that you normally find on an Arduino header. And then at the bottom, we've got the analog, uh, six analog signals. Also got some control signals, which are things like reset, three volt, free ground, five volt, AREF, etc., etc., and there's a few extra pins in which we used again previously on the Black Ice 2, which we're doing something similar here. I think three of those, three pins, three pins, I will probably put some, I'll probably use for the RGB pins on the uh, FPGA, and I'll, I'll come back because there are some differences with this FPGA versus the other one, but sticking with the microcontroller part. 
Um, so the microcontroller um, also um, is attached to the SD card on this particular design using SPI, which is useful for loading bit files and also for um, just having a you know a small file system. And I think there's about 128k ROM and 64k RAM. It's actually quite well endowed uh, for a microcontroller. When you're running C, that's more than enough. And if you're doing the Arduino stuff, that's more than enough. Not enough if you're doing Python and that kind of stuff, but it's plenty for Arduino and C type applications. So um, it's also got USB built in, just like the other 433 did. So uh, you've got your communication virtual COM port, exactly the same as we had on the previous ice, Black Ice. So when it comes to doing the software, you'll be able to use the same software tools. That won't change. It's not like Alloy, which is totally different in the way that that works. Uh, this works just like Black Ice did. So there's no departure from what people are used to on that front. And then the Arduino software, I want to get polished up so it's just a bit easier to use for loading the bit files and stuff as well. Um, what else have we got on here? So moving on to the, uh, the other thing I've got here is low cost regulators which again reduce the bill of material. So these are linear regulators. You've got the three volt three, very simple low cost one. And we've got a 1.2 volt regulator as well, uh, which can be used for both the VCC voltages required by the FPGA um, and also used for controlling cameras as well. And I'll come back to the camera bit because the camera bit's something that we need to talk about. So moving on, so what we're using, the FPGA we're using on here is the same that we're using on Alloy. Now the reason for doing that is because it's a good price point. Um, compared to the HX, it's equivalent. But here's the big bonus. Um, you've got that SRAM built in. That's really useful. So we don't have to add external memory in. Um, that we did on the original black eyes. That makes a big difference to the number of pins we need on the FPGA because we use about 40 pins to connect external memory, whether that's SRAM or SDRAM. So not having to do that makes a big difference. It's really, really economical to do that. And from a layout point of view, uh, it's a godsend um, because Laying out your memory tracks for things like SDRAM is a pain in the, it's a PITA. It really is because you have to match the lengths and it's nightmarish. Um, not only that, it causes problems when people come to use it. Um, the SRAM was easier than the SDRAM, but again, you have to write some fairly special uh, error log or whatever in order to make use of that so not having to do that is good so using that built in you know 1024 kilobits of ram or 128k uh built in sram along with the ebr the embedded blocks is really really handy with this chip so again I'm, I'm going with the same chip i am with alloy here the other reason that i might want to do that is if you reuse components um, it means that when I'm buying components for these boards from the supplier, if I'm using them across different boards, that means I'm buying larger quantities, which means I get a better price. Thanks, Ed. Uh, speak soon, mate. Is it Tech Shed tonight? Is that where you're off? Anyhow, thanks for joining us and thanks for the paper tip. Um, so the I'm using the Ice 40 5K. So that's cool. Um, the difference between this and Alloy is that the FPGA is 
a much more important part of this. In Alloy, it's a fusion between the microcontroller and the FPGA in such a way that uh, the microcontroller is in charge on it orchestrates things. Whereas on here, it tends to be cooperative. And quite often, a lot of the work, people don't actually use the microcontroller apart from loading up the uh, bit image for the FPGA. So the FPGA needs to have attached to it directly more pieces of the equation. So in this case, I'm adding in um, a quad SPI uh, flash per read only memory and quad S optionally quad SPI um, RAM. Again, I'm trying to use the same chips I'm using on Alloy. Again, my buying power increases if I use the same thing across two boards. So I can buy in higher quantities, that means I get better pricing. So those, these boards share some of this architecture. But in this case, those components, the flash, the extra flash and the extra optional, because I'll come back to that, uh, RAM, in this case, it's, it's, it's pseudo RAM. Uh, 8 megabytes or 64 megabits, which is plenty, which is more than you had actually for the external SD RAM uh, on the Black Ice MX, which only had 2 megabytes. So you actually get four times as much here. However, it's quad SPI. So obviously, the access speeds are lower because it's using QSBI, it's like a nibble interface, but it does support DDR. Um, and a lot of work has gone into um, supporting these quad SPI chips. There's been a lot of work done both on Icebreaker uh, and the new uh, mini board. Itsy Bitsy, Icebreaker Bitsy. Um, Peter's up new little mini board. Um, and the support for these devices is really good and they can actually max out the speed of these quad spi chips which is amazing uh, because on black ice we had the other problem when we tried to speak to the memory quickly we hit we hit issues we never really got to the top speed of those rams so even though these aren't as wide as the previous sd rams and s rams the rate is much higher and when you add in ddr which is double rate RAM. That means you, on both edges of the clock, you're transferring data. Um, that effectively means in one clock, you can write two nibbles, which is one byte. So it's like a byte interface when you're using the DDR. Um, when we use these SPI chip, quad SPI chips on the alloy, we're only accessing them at either 80 megahertz SDR or 40 megahertz SDR when we're connecting them to the ESP32 S2 on the alloy board because it's a limitation of the S2. That is as fast as the quad SPI goes. However, when we're connecting them up to the FPGA on here, we can go much faster because the FPGA is much faster than that. So we will get much closer to their top end rates. And don't ask me what the top end speed is. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's probably at least 100 megahertz, maybe more. Um, but it depends on the wiring and latency and all sorts of other things. It's going to be interesting to find out. But there's some very good HDL out there, Verilog written, particularly for the ICE Ultra Plus 5K to use those. It's been developed um, for things like the Icebreaker and the, Itzy, and the Icebreaker Itzy or Bitsy. Is it Itzy or Bitsy? I think it's Bitsy. So we'll be able to get some pretty good performance for that. So um, why might you want that additional stuff, given that you've got the internal SRAM? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons that you might need that. Uh, if you are doing camera work, for example, then you might want to buffer some of the camera frames off when you're processing them. So it's ideal to use the Quad SPI flash for that. And then you're keeping frames in the SRAM to do the processing and buffering the others off to the Quad SPI. That's quite useful. Um, if you wanted to use a large frame buffer, if you were doing GPU type work for microcontrollers for display outputs, again, having that extra buffering might be useful. 
Um, and having, having the ROM is obviously useful for loading code up. If you're building your own, you know, system on a chip that has its own processor, that needs to load its code. It also needs to, uh, it might need a heap, in which case you can use the Quad SPI flash for that. So even though the, your processor speed may be lower in, inside the FPGA than the uh, STM32 running 80 megahertz, you might be able to get it to like 70. Perhaps with something like the uh, Vector Risk 5. Um, the access to the SPI Quad SPI flash is actually quite rapid compared to the ESP2, for example. So it's going to be interesting to see how that works out performance-wise. But it, it's it's nice to be able to have access to that. And again, I may make that optional. I may include that as standard. Again, it's up for discussion. So you've got some good features in there. Plus, you've got the 5,000 lookup tables, which give you some flexibility. And you've got the eight DSP units, which are 16 by 16 multipliers with a 32 bit accumulator. So that's great for doing a whole bunch of stuff. Things that you couldn't easily do on the HX series. You know, if you wanted to do multiply, even fixed point multiply in the HX series, it meant using a lot of gates, or sorry, a, a lot of lookup tables, which mean you couldn't use them for something else, but it's also not as fast as the DSP units in many cases. The fabric inside this FPGA is slightly slower than the HX, has to be said. Um, what else have we got? So, and so the I.O. part of the FPGA is pretty good. It has differential as well as regular on some of the pins. Your mileage may vary with the quality of that. Uh, it's a bit tricky to choose the right pins for that. It's part of the IS40 range, so it's very familiar in terms of the way it's laid out inside. Uh, apart from having the extra SRAM. Uh, it has, you can, these kind of warm boot features as well, which is nice. And it can boot from flash, which again is cool. So it has the same sort of features that Black Ice has in that regard. It also means that the code I write, I've already written for the Black Ice, will pretty much be, you know, simple to port onto this. Which is nice, I like that. How are we going for time? Right. So the other thing on this board uh, that's worth looking at on the left hand side over here, you can see my cursor on the screen. Yeah, um, you've got a status RGB LED here and uh, there may be some other LEDs for the um, FPGA, but this status one is likely to be driven by the STM32. And that shows you things like the done light, it shows you the status of the um, loading and mode just like it did on black ice um, and it also can show power so that's really what that rgb led is about there you've got a user button which is kind of handy the other button at the top here is for putting it in dfu mode just like black ice so if you want to actually reflash uh, the stm32 you can do that as well so that's going to be exactly the same this connector here, so we've got another P mod over here, and we've got a mix mod over here. So the mix mod gives us two double P mods and the analog signals in between. So we maintain some of that mix mod compatibility from the Black Ice MX, which is good. We don't have as many, obviously, the FPGA is not as big in terms of IO pins as the HX8. Um, but we've got a nice double P mod here, which is great if you want to add in one of those really funky uh, HDMI interface cards or a VGA card or a VGA plus gaming card, that kind of thing. There are all sorts of different uh, things that you can add in here. You could even add in Hyper RAM if you really wanted to. Um, but down here, you've got another small double P mod as well which you can use which is good for doing things like inputs so you could add usb host uh, and the support for that is really good now actually uh, kate's luna is really good 
on the USB support in Verilog now. Um, do check out some of that. And I'll talk about that at some other point. Uh, it be worth doing a stream on some of that stuff. The other thing I've got down here is a camera connector. That FPC connector that we see on Ally, this is the same one here for connecting in one of these 8-bit parallel uh, low-cost cameras. So what I haven't worked out yet is how I'm going to alternate between these because if you're using the camera interface, you will not be able to use this PMOD. You can't use the two at once. And I can't just leave the PMOD here because there's not enough IOs for the camera to have a bit of a problem. Um, do I need to think about where do I put that? What I'm trying to avoid again to keep the cost down is, I mean, I could put the camera connector, the FPC connector on the bottom. You know, where have we done that before? Ta da We're doing it on the alloy. But the moment you start putting things on the bottom, it has to go through the pick and place assembly twice. Which makes the assembly more expensive. So it increases the cost of the board. So I'm trying to avoid putting anything on the bottom. Um, so I need to find a way where we can have the camera FPC interface here to support things like the OE R76, 26, whatever. And have the expansion available to the PMOD. So basically the pins that are used for the camera FPC interface here are replicated on the PMOD and also on these three pins down here. The extra three pins on the Arduino. So those won't be able to be used if you're using the camera, but everyone's going to use the camera. So having access to that additional PMOD is really useful. But I need to find some way of doing it so that we can have, you even make a choice when you buy the board, you buy it with the camera connector or you buy it with a PMOD. Or it'd be really nice to find a compromise that works for both. I mean, we could do a premium one that had the camera and the PS RAM and a lower cost one that didn't have those two. So we need to think about, you know, give me some feedback on those sorts of things, even now, later, or uh, on the forum. But that's something I need to consider, and that's obviously something I haven't worked out with this particular design yet, and whether there's a way of doing that. I mean, it might be possible to do something like this so if you install the PMOD you install it over the FPC connector that would mean that the PMOD sits slightly higher that's a possibility but it might be a bit awkward. Normally the FPC connectors have a little uh, clip. I wonder if I've got one that, that clamps down on the cable. Um, hold on. Now I want to use the same connector I'm using on Alloy. I know I'm going on repeating myself, but this is a way of keeping the bomb cost down. By using the same parts for both, that makes it cheaper to buy them because you're buying, you know, double amounts each time. Hold on. If we've got one in here. So, okay, these are the FPC connectors. Don't know if you're going to see these. Uh, will it focus? Let's use the trick. Let's use the Ed, the big Ed trick. All right, now can I get that 
close enough you can actually see oh it's all round the wrong way it's very confusing didn't want to focus on that damn it basically on the top you normally have a bit that you can push in that clamps down on the FPC uh, which is a very thin flat cable so if you've got a PMOD connector sitting over the top of that that may make it you can probably still get the cable in but you might not be able to secure the cable in so that's an issue that I have yet to resolve if anyone has any ideas suggestions now is a good time to tell me if you think of them later tell me later as well <laughs> or just you know dump it down on the forum but that's one problem that I've got to solve because I'd really like to have the camera connector on there because more and more people are doing camera work but in particular um, Lattice has done a lot of work using their, what do they call it, Sense AI I very low power machine learning and image recognition stuff open CV type stuff so um, I want to be able to include that feature excuse me for a sec so it'd be nice to have the camera on there maybe I can make it optional I don't know maybe that's a better way of doing it So that's the basic Black Ice 5 that I was hoping to start making a prototype of. Uh, I've got to get the alloy done first, obviously. So the next few weeks I'll be, I'll assemble the alloy, hopefully get the software working, test out the functionality, solve any hurdles that I come across with it. Hopefully there won't be too many. Um, and I'll probably at that point hopefully be enough done on Black Eyes 5 or V um, such that I can order a prototype of this as well the other thing that I've got to deal with as well as the um, camera interface is the actual name what do we call it? I want to use the Black Eyes moniker. We've used this successfully sometime, and I want to build on that because it's recognized. So I want the name to be Black Ice, whatever. It could be a number, a letter, or a couple of letters. It could actually be a name. Possibly one of the things that I did consider early on was calling it Black Ice ultra maybe because um actually the lattice size 40 up 5k is actually an ultra plus not an ultra but um that's where the ultra possibility came from again you guys if you've got ideas please do let me know i'd be fascinated uh, I love suggestions and given the issues that we had with Alloy um, it's a good idea to get input early on these namings although this should be a bit easier because um, we've already got the black ice part of it it's what follows that whether it's just a number a letter or a name or whatever the reason that I've used the black ice 5 or V Roman 5 in this case is because it's effectively version 5 now version 5 i'm cheating because version 0 was actually called my storm <laughs> so it's actually the 
six, but given that we started at black ice zero, it's kind of five, really, from a moniker point of view, if you were numbering. Um, or we could just keep it, keep it as black ice five. Uh, it's always good for starting conversations. Five? Well, what was Black Eyes for then? Uh, it takes some explaining. So anyhow, that's uh, that's the, potentially the new Black Eyes. Please do give me feedback, your thoughts on that, either here or on the forum later. Um, I quite like the way it's shaped up so far. Um, the mixture of pins, etc. The bomb, I need to do a bit more work on it. I think I can possibly squeeze a few more components out if I'm careful. Um, but in terms of the features, unless there's other things that people specifically want added i'm kind of happy with the features that exist within that current prototyping design black ice cam dsp 8-bit that's good i not thought of that black ice cam it would definitely have to have the fpc connector for the camera if that was the case right uh, as you say, you can offer it with the camera. Yes, you can. I want to offer the a camera that I know is supported with the uh, HDL on Alloy. I could make that the same camera with this with similar HDL support, whether that's Verilog or MMIGEN. You know, you can turn that that turns into Verilog anyhow. I would like to have it the same for both um, for fear of repeating myself the more you buy the same thing the cheaper that thing becomes so if it's the same for both boards it means I only have to be able to offer one thing and I can get a better price on it if it's being used for two purposes right so that is a good idea I quite like that black ice cam my only criticism would be out of the gate people are going to expect some cam support um, so we'd have to get our skates on and getting that done but uh, yes um, the only disadvantage with that would be would people that saw that think "Ooh, well I don't really need any camera work so maybe this isn't my kind of product it kind of um, sets it down a particular path maybe a bit of narrowing so on one hand it's a really good feature advertisement on the other hand it's um, potentially um, limiting for people that aren't looking for the camera part maybe maybe not uh, it could be good from a kind of um, getting it out there point of view. Uh, people are very interested in doing the image processing stuff right now. And it's great for things like robotics and stuff like that and devices that need to like sense people or sense animals or objects or things like that and trigger things happening from that. It's kind of a really interesting area right now for people. Um, all sorts of things you can do that uh, you know with the image processing side of things that are interested interesting you know if you wanted to use it on a drone or something perhaps if you want to use it to control a robotic vehicle so it can kind of see where it's going that'd be great you want to design your own romba maybe sort of some vision that'd be kind of cool 
I like it. Definitely. It's a really good idea. Thank you. DSP 8-bit. Nice. Um, okay. So what have I covered? I've covered uh, where it sits. Um, again, in terms of colours, it will be a blackboard. <laughs> Surprisingly. Um, we like we like having particularly that matte black. Okay, um, so DSP eight bit is saying maybe offering with a little support with some firmware from the MCU to run the cam and the TFT display and use the FPGA with a bypass channel. Okay, so between the um, STM32, the L433 and the ICE40 up 5K, um, as well as SPI, it's actually We've got all the pins there to be able to do quad SPI, which is how this is currently wired on this this cat. So um, from memory, I think when we did our quad SPI experiments before on the Black Eye Two, I think. I don't think we could run it faster than 40 megahertz. This may be slightly better. Um, I may be able to get the um, the I/O lines better. I certainly need to get them good because I've got the PS RAM and the SPI on there. Um, I think officially STM32 support is similar to ESP S2 32 S2 support in that. It either runs at like 80 megahertz. Um, I think it might be like 60 megahertz SDR and 40 megahertz DDR. But in the previous work where we had it working with Arduino, I think Richard, Richard confined it down to, I think it was 40 megahertz SDR. But we may be able to push that a bit further. But if you could do 40 megahertz DDR, then effectively that's that's equivalent to 80 megabytes per second <clears throat> which isn't too shabby really and that gives you quite a low latency between the two devices so in a scenario where you were doing the camera stuff the FPGA could be bringing in the bulk data could be down sampling the image stuff working through storing that or processing that in real time using the SRAM maybe picking out area of interest which is a smaller window sample which could be shoved back up 80 megabytes per second is pretty good I mean that's like a USB 2 high speed in fact it's faster than a USB 2 high speed on which you get some fairly high res cam camcorders and cam uh, cameras so you know you could be dumping quite a bit of pre-processed stuff that's processed in real time by the FPGA back to the STM32 in a nice um, format that saves it having to do as much processing, for example. Um, DSP 8 bit saying, or running a little RISC 5 CPU and some firmware, but don't know how. I'm not a RISC 5 expert, I'm still learning the black high um, Well, there are some cores already. Uh, in fact, the vector risk is the good one. And that was actually written in um, Spinal HDL. 
and there's a bunch of socks based on that. Litex, which is based on MyGen, which is the previous version, to NMyGen. NMyGen is what I'm using on Ally. Litex has a system on a chip design. It's quite easy using Litex. Pre-designed parts, components that you can assemble together, including the vector of risk five. Or you can go the other route like uh, Laurie does and use the uh, Spinal HDL directly or the system on a chip that's supported by Spinal HDL. Um, that's another way of doing it and Laurie can explain all about going down that route. So yeah, you can do the processing in the FPGA if you need to and then just pass the relevant information onto the STM3203. In other words, you can completely offload it, which is the best way of doing it, of course. And then the STM32 is just dealing with the orchestration parts rather than the intimate details of the frame processing. Vex Risk 5, thank you, Nori, for that correction. Um, that runs. I don't know what speed it runs on the icebreaker, which has the same chip. I should imagine it's probably about 60 or 70 megahertz max. Um, but it is pipelined as well, so. Yeah, I don't know how fast the uh, Minerva is, so yet. Yeah, I've yet to try that. Yeah, and also you can do the same thing going the other route. So if you wanted to use, maybe you want you to do attach a HDMI interface to this or just a VGA mixed model, P mod or something. Um, you could have the FPGA do all the graphics or the frame buffing and then you use that 80, you know, megabyte link between the STM32 and the, um, the FPGA as your GPU if you like. It's entirely possible going the other route. I think the combination is quite powerful and you could probably use you know I think Arduino is your way in to do the orchestration. So in this case you'll be talking about doing orchestration in C plus as I like to call it. Arduino's version of C++. C++ without all of the complicated bits. <laughs> Simple C++, object-oriented C, if you like, rather than proper templates and all that stuff. Ooh, getting dry. How are we doing for time? Right, well, I'm going to have to wrap up shortly. How long have we been streaming for now? It's got to be two hours and a bit. Two hours 13. Well, that's good. Are you guys falling asleep yet? I can go on a little bit longer. Please come back with any comments and stuff, those of you that are using the chat rather than just uh, watching or lurking. I'm interested in your feedback. What do you think, Laurie, of this Black Ice 5? Do you think it's a good replacement for it going forward? How does it fit with your uh, view of um, the kind of stuff that you do your work on? Could you see that being translated over onto the Black Ice 5? I don't know how much of the uh, gaming stuff can be transferred onto something like a Black Eyes 5. Can you foresee issues with some of those things, some limitations? Laurie?
Oh, so it's still the afternoon for you, DSP8. It's only 4.16 in Mexico, apparently. Very good. Warm afternoon, I shouldn't wonder. It's just been warm here for England, from the UK's point of view. But I bet it isn't as warm as Mexico. I don't know if you could get like the Atom stuff working on this. I can't remember what the memory requirements are for the Atom. You probably get Atom, but can you get the Beeb stuff ported onto it, Laurie, do you think? processing oriented I, I tend to view what's slightly different with the black ice and alloy and the other things is it's slightly heterogeneous um, you know if you've got a hardcore use the hardcore to do your processing stuff because it's probably faster in addition to the FPGA and it also doesn't use the gates that are in the FPGA lookup tables etc so you've got more gates and lookup tables to do the other things so that's yeah I, 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 I like that combination I don't know if Laurie's paying attention Anyone else have any feedback? DSP8 says current ISFPGA FPGA boards are oriented from just IO and RISC 5 and are expensive. Yeah, some of them can be expensive. There are some lower cost ones, but yeah. Um, a lot of people like to use the FPGAs to design processes and play around with processes. And certainly with RIS-5. I mean, you can still do that here, of course. But, but not every project is about making another von Neumann machine, you know. Von Neumann's been done so many times, right? Well, I appreciate that, just the 8 bit. Um, the stream may be going up and down a bit at the moment. I've had a couple of notifications from OBS saying that disconnect, reconnect. Apologies for that. Okay, so have I covered all my points? Where's my notes? I better check my notes. Hmm. How about I know one of my regular things that I've done in the stream is the uh, graveyard. Um, I incessantly design things, and. I may design lots and lots of different boards before I get to something that I like. It's just the way I kind of roll sometimes. So let me show you one that's very recent actually, which is quite an interesting one. If I can find it. Uh, so this was something I was designing before I ended up going to Alloy. So this was a board that never made it out. It's fully rooted. Uh, and this is kind of, the reason it didn't work for me was, um, it was a halfway house. 
took me a while to realize that I didn't want a halfway house. So this kind of sat halfway between black ice and alloy. Um, so that's why it didn't work out for me really as a design. So in this particular board, um, one of the things it had built in was the USB host connectors, the AE connectors, which is kind of cool. Um, but not everybody uses that functionality. They do take up a lot of room. The other thing is it didn't have any things like Arduino headers or anything like that, but it did have two mix mods. But one of the mix mods was highly compromised in terms of doubling up the pin usage with other things. And it sometimes that's okay, but a lot of the times that's um, very tricky. And it catches people out when they try and use the mix mods. You kind of have to always put lots of documentation out warning against it, the mix mods usage and stuff. So that's um, it's just not as clean. Uh, and the other thing is, so I didn't have the STM32 in here. I had uh, it was expressive based, but instead of using the expressive uh, ESP32 directly, uh, it used a module. I don't know if you've ever seen the modules. Uh, so they're like, uh, they have the antenna built in, PCB antenna. Then they have the circuitry, which is a microcontroller and a few support components for programming and stuff. Um, and then they have like a metal shield cap, square cap over the top of them. So that's, uh, that's what this bit is here. Uh, this is also incredibly difficult to route. It was really awkward. And I did mess about backwards and forwards for ages trying to get it to work. But I was never really happy with the routing on this. It was very cramped. One of the reasons for that is because of the amount of room that the um, module is taking that impacts it. Um, the other thing is when you add the USB hosts here, you have to add quite a lot of circuitry. In this case, all of this is dedicated to the USB host stuff, which is bomb shrapnel in my opinion, which is one of the other things I didn't like about this particular design and that's why it never really saw the light of day. I mean it was quite nice, compact design, I managed to fit everything in that I wanted to fit in, rooted the thing completely. But it was all just a bit too much of a compromise, really. Uh, and it wasn't, it just wasn't clear enough. It was too much of a halfway house. It was neither on one side or the other side of the fence. It was kind of sat smack bang uh, in the middle. So it didn't really work. Um, but it's always cool to kind of show some of my... Um, Misplaced artifacts, designs that didn't quite make it. And that's a recent one. That was ooh, a couple of months ago, maybe. Uh, and it took a while to actually put that one together. So that's my graveyard bit. And that's me pretty much done. Unless there's any more questions, I'm going to call it, call it a night. Afternoon in your case, DSB 8 bit, but uh, night for me. If no one has any further questions, I'm probably going to um, wrap up. Um, so, just as a reminder, please subscribe if you can. If I get to a certain number of subscribers, Twitch will actually keep my streams. I do record them as well, but it means uploading, transcoding, and all the other stuff. They have restrictions on what you can keep, but if you get a number of subscribers, they let you just keep your stuff up because it's obviously good for them. They get traffic, I guess. Um, it doesn't cost you anything, so um, if you can subscribe, do subscribe. It helps. It gives me privileges on Twitch, which are useful. 
Um, as far as, let me just go back to, just to remind you, the most imminent thing is this. So this week I will be working on Alloy. Hopefully the rest of the parts will arrive and I can actually start putting one of these together. I'll also get the programming working. Um, and then maybe, 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 maybe next stream, next week, we might be able to bring the board up. That would be really cool. I'd love to be able to do that next week. Maybe I sorted out some of the camera stuff as well by then. Um, that would be really nice. And then maybe I can focus in on some of the software and show some of that working and talk about what works, what doesn't work. I hope I'm in a position where it does work or at least part of it works. You never know with these things. So that's what I'm going to be working on this week. I'll be on the forum. Uh, so continue the conversations down there. Any of the feedback you want to give me on Alloy, any thoughts, please do share them. Any thoughts on the Black Ice 5, i.e. naming, what we do with the FPC connector for the cam, camera, etc. Anything like that, any suggestions, what you think. If you don't like it, tell me. If you like it, tell me. Uh, I'm interested in both things moving forward. So if you've got any more uh, feedback on that, please, you know, pop down to the forum. Um, let me just give you that. You can find the forum here. So just pop down there uh, if you want to talk in the meantime. And... Uh, there's already some interesting stuff down there if you're involved in the black eye stuff anyhow. It's always some good stuff to read. And do contribute. Do let your voice be heard, please. Particularly on the stuff that we discussed tonight. Um, so that just leaves me to all say thank you guys for joining me. I know it's been quite a long uh, stream today. Probably my longest one yet. It's been pretty good. I didn't have teething problems at the start, which is good. There's quite a few of these I have had. Um, thank you for spending the time to um, come and see what we're, what I'm working on as regards to the MyStorm stuff, the Alloy Board and the new Black Ice. Uh, and thanks for joining me in the chat especially. It's great to get the participation. And I appreciate your time. And hopefully I'll see some of you either down on the forum and or... Uh, on the stream, which should be same time next week, that's eight o'clock British summer time because we're still in British summer time, uh, 8 pm in the evening on Wednesdays. And thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evenings and or afternoons in DSP 8 bits case. And I will see you next week. Ciao.